just between you and me. <laughs> <laughs> and, and anyone else who's watching. <laughs> so I, 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 I sit and I think and I think. And I think that these Polish communities of Jews... Like, so, like, you know, New York, and you know, like, there's, this, there's this New York deli, and they go, it's a traditional Jewish deli, it does bagels, and it does uh, this great like, cured meat, and it does this great onion soup, and I'm like, yeah, that's traditional New York food, but it's, but it's not, right? And it's not even traditional Jewish food, it's traditional Polish food. There's an awful lot of what we what we call now Jewish, and I don't mind it. I'm just uh, it's, you know, I often wonder if has anyone ever said, well, you know, bagels aren't you know they didn't invent those. They were like they're there for a reason, um, and they're they're there because they are what was the norm. And the reason potatoes and things are so important is because it's all they had. I just right. I so, wonder. So. So the short answer is yes, uh, <laughs> but uh, let me see if I can give you a long answer that you can include in the, the recording if you'd like, okay. uh, with or without your question as a lead-in. So um, the Hasidic Jews were ironically, uh, because nowadays the Hasidic Jew is often seen as the, the face of tradition. Um, when Hasidic Judaism was beginning in the early generations, was, was attacked as being anti-traditional. Uh, the, 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 the other keepers of Judaism at the time, the, the old guard, if you will, um, accused Hasidic Jews of changing the prayers, which they did, uh, and of changing the style of prayer, which they did significantly, of cheapening the, the value of study and traditional observance, which they didn't, um, but which I can understand why the old guard felt they did, because they were saying that if you were unable to uh, engage in traditional study to the highest level, that you still had value even from either cursory study or from other joyous forms of expression. So they were attacked as being anti-traditional, and there were um, many instances, not always, but many instances of uh, fights between the old guard and the Hasidic uh, revolutionaries, uh, up to and including violence um, uh -huh. between them, which is ironic, as I said. Because nowadays the Hasidic movements are often seen as being traditional. But the, the traditions that they carry on were, were born during these dynastic uh, times when every action of your Rebbe was laden with spiritual significance. And, uh, and therefore, as I don't know if you know, but I mean, even to this day, the, uh, the crumbs from the, the Rebbe's table are, are considered spiritually imbued. Uh, and, and that is... Uh, again, an irony for what was a revolutionary group um, to become something that is considered now to be the most traditional uh, says a lot about how the process of revolutionary works, uh, our revolutions work. All right, uh, so that, that does make a lot of sense as to uh, pertaining to the inclusion of what we think is typically Jewish. Because it's not likely that people are going to say, oh, did you see the way that he uh, buttered his croissant? That is, you know, we should butter our croissants like that because they didn't have croissants. It makes sense that the the time and the place that they were living in, the type of clothes they would have had, the type of food they would have ate, eaten, because they, they were those clothes and it was that food, they didn't change. They just kept with the same thing. And that, that makes sense. It also makes sense that when the Jews were driven out of Poland and a lot of them went, went headed towards America. They wanted those old, say old, they wanted those home comforts. Familiar. Right. They wanted the familiar forms. And, and really that's, that's an important side because it's really very, very easy to, to mock the adherence to the level uh, of, of tradition to the level that many Hasidic communities do and say, oh, you know, do they really think that what kind of hat you wear is spiritually significant? And the short answer is, of course, yes, they do. Um, the longer answer is, and of course they do, because being part of a community and following those forms has a spiritual significance in and of itself. And the long, long answer is, and so do the rest of us. Now, we don't necessarily believe that we have to wear exactly the same hat that our father wore, um, but we do believe that following the organized patterns of worship the, and of observance that worked for our ancestors 
will also provide spiritual in, uh, pathways for ourselves. We don't say, look, Abraham had to forge his own path to God out of nothing. You go forge your path to God out of nothing. We, we don't say Moses had to go find his own burning bush. You find your own burning bush. We say, look, look. God gave us Torah with commandments, and, and the rabbis have guided us on how to observe those commandments. And if you observe those commandments, A, you're in compliance with the covenant, and B, you will be able to, hopefully, reap the spiritual benefits that come from that, that observation. Now, sorry, from that observance. The, the Hasidic may take it to a level that many of us are uncomfortable with or at least think of as being uh, excessive, but the basic idea that repeating a physical act in the hope of attaining the same spiritual result, whether it be my own act um, or whether it be watching someone else's act, actually has really good grounding in, in, in spiritual, psychological, and sociological um, reasons. Um, it's just they do it to a degree that most of the rest of us are not uh, comfortable with. It makes sense to me that if I was standing in front of a hedge maze, I would follow the most worn path in the grass. Exactly right. Even if you thought, you know, there might be a shortcut, I don't want to get lost. And I'll follow this path.